I'd like to start this week with an announcement. To be a satirical news host, especially of a show like Sam Delaney's News Thing in 2017, and to live as a committed homosexual has felt impossible for me. From the very first day of my leadership of this show, I faced questions about my homosexual faith. I was brought up to be a practicing homosexual. I come from a long line of homosexuals. My mother's homosexual, my father is a screaming homosexual. And let us not forget, Britain is a fundamentally homosexual country. That's why I have chosen to step down to spend more time with my loose association of well-toned, oiled hard body strangers, leather daddies, and great big muscle Marys. It's Saturday night, it's almost live, and it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's News Thing. The three finalists for African American Businesswoman of the Year 2017 joining Sam this week are, wait a second, it's Zoe Lyons. I think there's been a mistake. It's Evelyn Mock. Oh, for crying out loud, it's Michael Legg. Plus, our special guest, it's the R&B legend whose voice alone is enough to bring you to climax in Argos. It's Alexander O'Neill. Hello and welcome to Sam Delaney's News Thing. Thanks for joining me, panel. Now, in the early hours of Wednesday morning, Grenfell Tower in West London caught fire and within 15 minutes was engulfed in flames. A few hours later, the 24-storey block, home to some 600 people, was gutted and all that was left was a charred black husk. There were a few lucky survivors, but it's assumed that the majority of people inside are dead. In the days that have followed, there has been one glimmer of light through the darkness of this tragedy. Everyone in the melting pot communities of Notting Hill came together, from the rude boys of the estates to the posh twats from the million pound Richard Curtis houses, from the Muslims who were first on the scene because they were up late for Ramadan, to a bunch of Scientologists who flocked to street corners dishing out water. I was there. I saw them. I didn't drink any of the water, but I'm sure it was fine. Even before this fire, the area's diverse harmony was under threat, though. The scruffy bit that surrounds Grenfell Tower had been in the process of what people call regeneration, where private property developers built snazzy apartments for rich folk. Meanwhile, residents of Grenfell Tower have been complaining to the council for years about their living standards and had repeatedly and specifically warned of the very real risk of a major fire. The council ignored their concerns and instead spent all of the investment money available on sticking a load of cheap, flammable plastic cladding on the outside of the building to make the tower less of an eyesore to their new rich neighbours. They could have spent that money on, I don't know, a sprinkler system and a proper fire alarm, but they thought basically, nah, fuck them. This is endgame capitalism, the upshot of seven years of austerity where councils literally couldn't afford to make homes safe for kids to live in. But, of course, they could afford it if they wanted to. Austerity was a political decision that George Osborne and David Cameron thought made them look grown up and electable. But the Tories may just have sown the seeds now of their own demise by cultivating a new, expanded and angry underclass. Is it too early to make political points out of this horrible event? No, fuck that. This was entirely political. It was the result of systemic neglect of the poor and disenfranchised by the ugliest face of profiteering, turbo capitalism. They'll probably be right, soon I expect, and then the papers can all get back to fearing, loathing and stigmatising the urban communities who we've been impressed by for the past four days. Now, London-based YouTube sensation Ransom Bantz joins me now. Rance, tell me, how do you feel about the events of this week? It's a shambles. Like, I'm angry, as a lot of people are, but I think it's more frustration more than anger in terms of everyone's coming together. Like, if you're out on the streets, Everyone seems to be in good spirits. But in general, I think it's more frustration than anger. I think the anger's going to come a bit later, to be honest. What did you make of Theresa May showing up but not bothering to meet with any of the survivors? Mate, she's a donut. But you know what it is? We're not surprised. She's been avoiding us the whole time. She's been avoiding people. I don't even know how she's married. Human contact doesn't seem to be her thing, to be honest. Even the Queen's out there meeting survivors. I've seen pictures of the Queen talking to people. So if Lizzie can do it, why the hell can't she? Do you know what I mean? It doesn't make sense. It's very hot. Uh, people are angry. The days are getting longer. And the authorities don't seem willing to help. Do you think this is all heading towards unrest on the streets? Oh, absolutely. Like, I called it the first time. When we had the first um, London riots, I said, 
when the Tories come in, you cannot take away from the underprivileged. They've got nothing anyway, so they've got nothing to lose. I feel like this could be the tipping point. I think something needs to be done or it's going to spill over and it's going to get naughty. I feel like it will. Rance, thanks for joining us. No problem, mate. Uh, OK, uh, panel, uh, what do we make of this? It's been called corporate manslaughter. A head's going to need to roll, Zoe. We all saw the horrific pictures on the news and fire shouldn't spread that quickly, not in 2017. It, just, it should not happen. And for the mm. inhabitants of the building to be told to stay put as well because fire should be contained within a block of flats, it should not penetrate other flats, uh, it's, it's horrific. It is an embarrassment to this country, isn't it? I mean, no offence to countries like Bangladesh, but when you see a tower block burning down, you think, that's the sort of shit that happens in Bangladesh, mm. not in one of the richest parts of the richest country in the world, Evelyn. They'd recently gone through a £10 million refurbishment. It would have just cost, like, £300,000 to, to install sprinklers or install, like, some kind of fire, uh, fire safety uh, alarms and stuff like that. There are those who say it's a bit early to make it into a political thing. It's not really, is it? It is a political it, thing. Yeah, it is mm. a political well, thing. Well, from the second hand, yeah, of course it's a political thing. In fact, all these people who go, who go online, I mean, everyone loves a social media argument. It was why it was invented. Uh, people, do you remember the old days people used to walk in the street and say hello when really we wanted to punch each other in the face? <laughs> and social media has given us that beautiful, beautiful platform. Uh, but immediately people were going, oh, I can't believe some people are trying to make this political. It's political. Mm. Yeah. The very, the very uh, aspect that Theresa May didn't go and see survivors yeah. says uh, everything you need to... It's, it's entirely political. She didn't go and see them because she knew she was going to get an absolute shit fight. She yeah. was she busy was... and she sunburns easily. <laughs> Bad times. Thanks, panel. Now, Tim Farron. He's not the messiah. He's not even a very naughty boy. He is simply a knobhawk. See, Tim is a Christian who believes in the literal word of the Bible, even the fucking mental ones. And this week, he resigned as leader of the Liberal Democrats, not because his party had a poor result in the general election, but because he thought that was incompatible with leadership, like someone in Game of Thrones, except played by a worried squirrel. <laughs> this drew heat in the campaign when he was asked again and again whether he believes homosexual sex is a sin. Of course, Tim does, but he couldn't admit as much in case it wiped the Liberal Democrats off the political map again. Eventually, Tim had to lie and say he didn't really believe homosexual sex would be punished with an afterlife in hell. But those pesky journalists wouldn't leave off, and that made him mad. I seem to have been the subject of suspicion because of what I believe and who my faith is in. In which case, we are kidding ourselves if we think we yet live in a tolerant, liberal society. What's that, Tim? The kind of tolerant liberal society where homosexuals go to hell for having sex with their bums doesn't sound very liberal to me, or by the looks of it, to the members of your party. I am passionate about defending the rights and liberties of people who believe very different things. Look, <laughs> evangelicism and liberalism go together like Sharia law goes with a night out at Essex night spot faces. Tim isn't admitting that, however. Instead, he's playing the victim. He's not the first leader to be Christian, of course. Tony Blair, Theresa May, David Cameron, all Christians. It's just that they cleverly covered it all up by doing terrible things like Christians, of course, would never do. If only Tim had just been more honest about his views, like in this early political broadcast. I'm kind of very proud of my background and have incredibly fond memories of my childhood. <laughs> I was moved emotionally by something and thought that I could make a difference if I got involved. And I'd certainly make a lot more difference than if I just sat on my backside and let it all happen without me. I don't have a problem with them, I just don't want them near my kids. You keep your backs to the wall, that way they can't get you. All right, love, she's not a dyke, is she? No queer business, mate, just, just a straight cut, nothing poncy. So you put the puffer in here and it sucks out all the gay. Exactly as I remember it otherwise. Of it doesn't smell of fags anymore. <laughs> the best advice I ever got, probably from anybody, was from Jesus. He just said to me, you should be yourself. Zoe Lyons, are homophobes the real victims here? <laughs> well, 
Well, listen, this, oh, Tim, it, the, the election was only last week, and last week he was going, look, my faith doesn't get in the way, like a weird <laughs> Wallace and Gromit sort of <laughs> confused man. It don't get in the way, it's all right, we all like him, you know. <laughs> I've met a gay, quite nice. <laughs> and then suddenly a week goes by, and he goes, do you know what? Don't like him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it will burn in hell. Maybe he just needs, uh, you know, a good bumming. Possibly. <laughs> <You know. laughs> I mean, that could be the solution that's Bang. staring him in the face. Bang the Jesus. Yeah. 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 Um, Michael, do you think someone who believes in fictional ghost men should be allowed to run for office instead of just being sectioned? In any conversation I will ever have about this subject, if you're Christian, if you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, whatever your faith is, I will always say, I respect that. I will always say that. But what I will be thinking is, <laughs> you're fucking mental. What is wrong with you? Exactly Grow right. up! Exactly right. I mean, be allowed to run the country, and I certainly yeah. wouldn't let one park my car yeah, because no. they don't have a strong enough grip on physics and yes. science. <laughs> <laughs> um, some people might say that this is just persecuting Christians for their, let's be honest, perfectly reasonable objections to anal. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, they've got some. They always big go objection. down the anal route, don't they? Yeah, always, that, always, always. That is specifically his objection. Could this just be an irrational fear he has of getting pegged? Yes. Maybe. What does pegged mean? Is this one of these new coded terms, terms that you've it's, been referring to? It's, it's when your when your missus uh, puts on a, a little strap a little on. strap on and then Bums goes you. to town on you. Yeah. Bums you. Um, have you heard of ice stocking? <laughs> Oh, so he has, no, but clearly. No, my, my, <laughs> my imagination is running Ice wild. stocking is apparently where you do a poo, you freeze it solid, oh, and then you penetrate oh. someone with it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what Tim Farron's position on it is, but I think the public deserve to know. Does it have to be? Is that no. a sin? Mm. Anyway, coming up, Daily Mail columnist Andrew Pearce and superstar soul legend Alexander O'Neill, and I will be getting one of them to sing a song. And we'll be talking Theresa May and the DUP. But what are the DUP? I, for one, have never heard of them. So to fill you in, here's an archive film to explain everything. See you in a minute. What the hell are the DUP? Have you heard the one about the Irishman what thought he was an Englishman? No? Then you ain't heard of the DUP. See, the DUP are a bunch of mixed-up Irish fellas what reckons they're actually British. In fact, they love being British even more than we do. They march around everywhere in their Sunday best and they eat fish and chips every day of the week. Steady on, lads. And their boss is a vicar what's always shouting all the time. Blimey! I wouldn't want my vicar shooting his mouth off like that. It might give away all my confessions. Mind you, it'd take him a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all Protestant, see? Which is a sort of Christian what hates everything, including statues, women, special gentleman friends, and even the bleeding Pope. What's he ever done? Sound balmy, don't they? But one day they could be running the old joint. Crikey, imagine putting Paddy in charge of this gaff. It'd be the end of bleeding days. Still, keeps them off the sauce, I suppose. Fair play to them, I say. Ta-ra! Welcome back. Now, it seems like everything Theresa May touches right now turns to shit. She spent all the political capital earned during the Brexit campaign when she wowed everyone with her astounding ability to keep her fucking mouth shut and look vaguely competent while everyone around her fell on their own swords. And they're Tories, so of course they really do have their own swords. Her latest craven attempt to cling on to power is to call in help from the fetus-loving, homo-hating DUP, who would have seemed a bit extreme overseeing a witch trial in the 17th century, let alone now. Basically, she is spent. She's like Hitler in the last few days of the war. The socialists have broken through the gates of Berlin and she's just holed up in her bunker, desperately avoiding all the people she sent to die and having amphetamine nightmares. Of course, it's not quite fair to compare her to Hitler. He was actually quite popular. This week, she fucked up again by visiting the Grenfell Tower block fire without meeting a single resident. She knew she had to go, but she couldn't actually meet ordinary people because she's terrified of them. Meanwhile, Jeremy Corbyn was down there hugging people like he'd just boshed a couple of E's and it was 1989. <laughs> Even the Queen's been down and we know how emotionally repressed she is. The thing is, Theresa May's not stupid. She's seen the voters reject her vision for hard Brexit. She's seen her popularity crash through the floor. She knows it's all over. And so she's spending her last days getting everything straight. 
She's telling Michael go. She loves him. She's always loved him. She bought Amber Rudd that handbag she's always liked. And she's giving David Cameron back the negatives of the photos where he monstered that pig in the gob. And then she'll call the general election and just slip away into the darkness forever. It's almost impossible to tell what's going on in the tiny, twisted mind of Theresa May right now. But if anyone knows, it's going to be a Tory. And I'm joined by a real live one now. It's the Daily Mail's Andrew Pearce, a genuine Tory. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Sam. You hear all the inside gossip, so who'll be the Tory leader in September in time for the next election? I've got a horrible feeling it might still be Theresa May. But if there is a coup and they topple her, Put your money on Boris Johnson, the old Etonian. But then my wages are not very good because I put £60 on the Tories to win with an overall majority, so lost my money. Yeah, most people did. Would Boris have a chance at being PM or is he too much of a liability, do you think? Well, he, he does at least connect with real people and people like him. I've been out on the road with him campaigning. It's a bit like going out with a rock star. Uh, it's a bit like being with Madonna. People come up and touch him. They want to see him. Uh, and, of course, we know he's got the common touch with people because, of course, he's fathered one or two children outside of marriage, which may <laughs> help him appeal to some families that are not the traditional nuclear family that the Tories <laughs> talk to. Um, why didn't Theresa May go out and meet a single resident at Grenfell Tower? She doesn't know how to talk to people. She is a robot, I'm afraid. And uh, I've always known she's a robot. I've known her for 20 years, but I know nothing about her. And she was found out in that election campaign. She met one person once who complained, and she never saw another person again out on the road. She's hopeless. That's the truth. How bad does she have to get before your paper, the mail, actually back Corbyn? She'd probably have to ch kill children at birth before we back Jeremy Corbyn. The Daily Mail could not bring itself to back a bearded Bolshevik. No, I bet. Um, there must be a lot of genuine anger towards Theresa May now, and she still hasn't actually done a deal with the DUP, has she? No. I mean, we saw her off at a football match in Paris this week when she still doesn't actually have an effective government put together yet. I mean, that doesn't look good at all, does it? No, and nor did the Mexican wave. She did, did you notice? She was the only person in the VIP box who did the Mexican wave. Macron, the new French president, thought she'd gone mad. <laughs> I think she has. I mean, this is a serious question, Andrew. Do you think she might, with all the pressure, with, you know, the terrorist attacks, the Grenfell Tower, the election disaster, do you think she's losing her marbles here? Uh, that assumes she's, all, she's still got them. Uh, I think she's having a very difficult time, and each day seems to bring another disaster. She had two advisers called Fiona and Nick. One was called Rasputin, the other one was Lady Macbeth. They've been fired, and it's clear now she can't function without them. It's a cheap shot, though, by her, wasn't it? She mucked up the election, she called it. She's thrown her unelected advisers under the bus. Yeah, it, it is a cheap shot, but, uh, but the th trouble is, you see, the Tories don't want her to resign because they think if there's a leadership contest, there'll be a clamour for a general election. And looking at the polls, Mr Corbyn, who once was more unpopular than me, uh, <laughs> is so popular now, he would win probably with a large landslide. And, of course, he'd bankrupt the country because that's what socialists always do. <laughs> oh, well, on that note, Andrew Pearce, thanks for joining nice us. Nice to see you. Um, OK, let's ask you about the DUP, Michael. I always thought it was like a parcel courier or an 80s synth band. Yeah. But they're much more sinister than that, right? Part of me uh, is delighted. Mm. The evil part of me is delighted that there's a Tory co coalition with the DUP. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's it like living in England <gasps> with all that terrorism and the DUP and stuff? What? Uh, I mean, yeah. they're going to come over and they are totally going to divide England. And can you imagine what that must be like living <laughs> in a divided country? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they, whatever you imagine, they are. And I imagine you think they're pretty bad. Yeah, um, they're in balaclavas and they're shouting all the time. They're not in balaclavas, they're loud and proud of it. They wouldn't yeah. wear a balaclava. Little bowler, bowler hats. Yeah. <laughs> they love the little bowler hats, White don't gloves. they? Yeah. Whistles. Yeah, they don't want to touch people. Penny whistles, White penny yeah. whistles. They love a parade. Yeah. In fact, we love a parade, they love a parade. We love to dress up, they love to dress up. If you could just swap the whistles and the drums for a bit of Kylie, almost no <laughs> difference. Exactly, you yeah. can settle Spot the all difference. of your differences. And ironically, DUP does sound like something that that's what the Tim Farron is afraid of. If this deal goes ahead, people are saying it completely undermines the Good Friday Agreement. Would you be worried that that will mean violence on the streets of Ireland quite quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, I, I mean, I, I assume practically everyone in Northern Ireland is thinking that. But what I really worry about, I mean, 
part of me finds it funny, but only because I'm terrified of it. But I can't help but think that somewhere there's a wee village in Northern Ireland, and there's a wee pub in this wee village, and there's a little group of late to middle-aged um, men uh, watching the TV news, and they're going, should we get the band back together? Yeah. And that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. Great stuff. Cheers, panel. Now it's time for my very special guest. The iconic 80s soul singer. Sold out Wembley Arena for six straight nights. Racially abused by Reg from Coronation Street. Don't criticize his lifestyle. It's Alexander O'Neill. Alexander O'Neill, uh, what an honour it is to have you, a soul legend in the studio. Now, we're all huge fans of your work here on the show and we want to talk about that in a little while. But also, I know that you're a man who takes an interest in political matters too. And that's what we uh, we like to talk about on this show. So okay. <laughs> let's start with that. Uh, we got asked about Donald Trump, another controversial week. He's under constant scrutiny. There are constantly allegations being made against your president. Uh, do you think that's fair, or do you think there's just a conspiracy amongst people in America? Well, you know, I mean, this is such a time in America to change. It's the American really don't know what to do with it, to be honest with you, you know, because this is the first time that we've ever elected a non-politician for president. So the guy brings all of his business savvy. He brings that to the party as well. So I, I myself personally, I'm willing to give him a chance. And certainly we didn't get anything from the Obama administration, nothing at all. I'm definitely not African-American for sure. So uh, this guy is putting people back to work, getting jobs for people. Uh, I'm willing to give him a chance. So you were dissatisfied with the first black president of the United States. Why was that? Barack Obama didn't do anything for black America. And we waited a long time when we did a lot. I'm from Mississippi. I marched, I went through the civil rights movements, the whole nine yards. And uh, we waited a long time to, for that moment to come, to get a black president. And we thought that we'd get a lot of results in, uh, in black neighborhoods and stuff, but I, I didn't see any, any prosperity come. All I saw through the uh, Obama administration was the rich got richer. That's all I saw. A lot of people say about Donald Trump, though, that he is a racist. Some of the things he said make some people think he's a racist. Do you think he is? Well, if, if he is a racist, you know, at least I'd rather know, I'd rather see it and it be out on the counter than to deal with a bunch of the racists uh, that are in the world that are hiding behind uh, a cloak. You know, uh, uh, if, you know, I'm from Mississippi, so racism is nothing new to me. You know, one thing about down, being raised down south, you know what you were dealing with. It was obvious back in the 50s and the 60s, it was in your face, and it was obvious what you were dealing with. I would much rather have a president like Trump that's out in the open, and if he's walking the borderline that you're going to perceive it as he's a racist or whatever, then it's your right to do that. My personal opinion, I'm willing to give him a chance. He's doing something. Whether he's a racist or not, He's not talking about doing. He's not talking about putting people back to work. He's not talking about getting jobs. He actually is doing it. Is he doing and it? That's what Has America, that happened and yet? that's what Americans want. That's what Americans want. Has okay. it happened yet? Yes, it's constantly happened. It's happened when he first came in. I'm not here to campaign for Donald Trump, but I'm saying that we, as Americans, we have to rally behind our country and rally behind our president and give him a chance. Now, let's talk a, a bit about uh, the music business. Now, when, when you first became a global superstar, it was at a time when kind of R&B, soul music, pop, overtook rock music as like the leading genre in the world, the biggest selling genre in the world. But the other icons of your generation that made that happen along with you, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Prince, Luther Vandross, they're all dead and they all died young. You're still standing. <laughs> well, how does that make you feel? Well, it makes me feel great because, first of all, I'm an O'Neill. And we O'Neills were very hard to kill, you know, <laughs> to be honest with you. But, uh, no, it, it, you know, uh, I'm not a Bible thumper. I'm a very spiritual man. I'm not a religious man. I'm a spiritual man. And God gives to who he pleases to give to. 
And, um, you know, uh, I think that he's blessed me to be able to keep doing the same thing I've been doing for the last 30 some years. And, and what are you doing at the moment? What's next for you? Where can we see you? Actually, I'm doing, a, I think it's a Greenwich. Greenwich, that's right. Greenwich Outdoor Festival. I'm doing, uh, be there for the 4th of July, which is American 4th of July, yeah. but I don't know if you guys, do you guys celebrate 4th of July? Well, we do pay tribute <laughs> to our American friends on that day, yeah. Anyway, I'll be doing that, and I'm also working on a brand new album that we really think very highly of. We can't wait for that. Now, um, I've got a question that you might or might not have been asked before. If you, Alexander O'Neill, could sing one of your greatest hits with any much-loved journalist and broadcaster in the world. <laughs> Who would it be? Would it be, I don't know, Larry King? Uh, would it be David Letterman? Would it be our very own Angela Rippon? Or would it be me, Britain's best journalist, Sam Delaney? Sam, Who would I'm going to go with Sam Delaney, Britain's best. That's the right my, answer. This is my guy. Okay. <laughs> That's the right answer. Let's take it away then. And before we do so, I'd like to say to my panel tonight, <laughs> Evelyn Mott, Zoe Lines and Michael Legg, go fuck yourselves. I'm singing with Alex and none of you are. <laughs> Feel free to join in from the sidelines. Also, thank you to our Tory boy, Andrew Pearce, and Ransom Bance. Take it away, gang. Uh oh, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Can't you find something else to talk about? Is this song the only one you sing? Makes you look better when you put things down. Who is your opinion? Don't criticize my friends. Friends. He got it. Don't criticize my ideals. Ideals. Don't criticize my lifestyle. Lifestyle. Sing this part, sing it. I'm fed up, cause all you ever do is criticize. Goes your mind. Baby, don't criticize. Want what is right? Now, Still you say, I'll criticize, know. criticize. <laughs>